Raven Batty County Board of Commissioners regular session for Monday, August the 6th is now in session. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Certainly. Commissioner Jones? Here. Commissioner Liner? Here. Commissioner McCabe? Here. Commissioner Sampson? Here. Commissioner Tyson? Here. Vice Chair Dacey? Oh, Chairman Mark? Here. Will we stand for the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. Lord, we seek your blessing on the tasks that lie before us. Yes, Lord. Bless our deliberations. <laughs> Bless our, our commissioners with wisdom, our work with clarity, our accuracy, and our decisions with impartiality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Mm. Okay. We have a, had an opportunity to look over the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Nays. Ayes have it. <coughs> Uh, next is the petition of citizens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before we get started, let me make one clarification. If I mispronounce your word, please don't hold it against me. I'm not as good as Commissioner Dacey is on these names. So, first one, Jerry Shell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I'm Jerry Shell. Uh, I'm a resident of Craven County, and I'm Chairman of the God and Country Christian Alliance, formerly the Craven Pamlico Christian Coalition. And I wanted to thank you uh, for the position that you took on Sunday sales. I appreciate you uh, actually taking a stand. Uh, I call it your Popeye stand. Can't stand, it's all you can stand and can't stand no more. And but th this evening I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Equal Rights Amendment. And this afternoon, I'm one of the ones that's old enough to remember the debate back in the 70s when we first, first had the debate. And this afternoon, I listened to a 30-minute debate between Phyllis Shafley and um, Betty Frieden. Uh, Phyllis Shafley was the, that's really where she got her start, was on the Equal Rights Amendment as an opponent, and she established the Eagle Forum. Betty Frieden was um, the first uh, president of the National Organization for Women. It was, it was a very interesting debate. Um, and what, what's amazing is to listen to them, the, the issues back then included men and women using the sa same bathroom, if that sounds familiar, uh, and gay marriage. That was 42 years ago, gentlemen. Um, the last statement that was made by Betty Fried, and hopefully the Equal Rights Amendment will pass by 1979, referring to the deadline that was then imposed. And after that, it was extended by Congress for a few years, but they still didn't meet that. This, this really is a, is a moot issue. Um, I know you all have spent quite a bit of time on it, and that's unfortunate, because um, we're, we've been going back 42 years, and the deadline is, is long past. And since then, it's, uh, if, if, if you want to look at the issues that they talked about back then, uh, the fear was if they passed the Equal Rights Amendment, we'd have gay marriage. Well, <laughs> the Equal Rights Amendment was not passed, and we have gay marriage. So. And there's other issues similar to that. So what is the issue? The issue is simply those on the left trying to bring this forward uh, to get a little wind in their sails. And I think that this board, the way, the way we look at it, you have three options. You can pass a resolution to endorse the Equal Rights Amendment. You can oppose the resolution or just let it lie. Um, if, you, if you actually vote to oppose the resolution, and in my view, what you're doing 
is simply affirming that it has uh, a place on your agenda. It really doesn't. Um, th this, this issue should be just left to die on the table, and I, I would hope that you do that. Now, attesting to the white hair that I have, uh, I have a memory that goes with it. Uh, after you passed, uh, your, after you had the vote opposing uh, earlier Sunday sales for um, alcoholic beverages, I, I bought seven cans of Popeye spinach to give you, and I put it someplace where I couldn't forget it, and I forgot it anyway. <laughs> so, I have one can of spinach that I'll give to the chairman, you all have to share it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Can I accept that, Mr. Attorney? <laughs> Just leave it there. I'll leave it there. Yeah, sorry. Hal James? That's a, that's a tough act to follow. I'm Hal James. I live at 305 Calico Drive in River Bluffs, which is a Craven County community. I'm also chairman of the Coastal Carolina Taxpayers Association. I'm a spokesperson for them, have been for a number of years. I'd like to note the impressive results shown by the Workforce Readiness Report, an impressive 36% job success rate. Uh, I have to admit to have been a little surprised about that, George. I spoke to Mr. Singleton and congratulated him on that before the meeting. Um, I went to a number of Newburn Housing Authority board meetings. Let me read a little from their website. The Housing Authority of the City of Newburn is a public housing authority managing affordable apartments in the Newburn, North Carolina area. Our housing developments offer clean and healthy living environments for reasonable rents scaled by income. We also have a number of community empowerment and enrichment programs available. Discover for yourself how public housing can be an excellent stepping stone toward moving into your own home. Now I wonder if they ever give a success rate to anyone about their success in moving residents into their own homes. I'd like to be interesting to know. I also see on our agenda for tonight that Commissioner Mark will be asked to sign an ordinance to authorize spending $750,000 of revenue from the North Carolina Department of Commercial Rural Economic Development Division to finance development of Craven County's Housing Assistance Program. Uh, also attached to this agenda is a proposed community-wide citizens participation plan with Don Baumgartner as contact person. The Newburn Housing Authority also has a citizens participation or had a citizens' particip particip participation plan and ignored everything the citizens had to say, and I was there to hear it. And he really botched the whole thing, spending over $80,000 per unit and not even able to change or enlarge the apartment's floor space. The description of this plan includes getting input, especially from low and moderate income citizens. Nowhere is taxpayer participation invited. I guess the government doesn't want the people paying for it to have much to say about it. I have another question. Will the people displaced by changes in the Newburn housing development be moved into Trent Woods? The newspaper had a big article recently about subsidized housing being built off Trent Road and Carolina Avenue in Trent Woods. What's happening in this overall subsidized housing picture is not clear to me, and I hope Mr. Baumgartner or someone else would explain all this. Thank you. Susan Long. Susan Long, 1990, Acorn Drive, Newburn, North Carolina. When it comes to change, North Carolina is slow and cautious. North Carolina was the 12th state out of 13 to ratify the United States Constitution back in 1789. Now North Carolina has a chance to be famous for being the last state needed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Good old number 38. This is our one year anniversary of meeting with you on the topic of equal rights. Happy anniversary. I am not a lawyer, but I do know when a Supreme Court justice speaks, they have given full and measured thought to the law. So tonight I remind you of the opinion of Chief Justice Antonin Scalia, and I quote, the 14th Amendment does not apply to discrimination against women because the measure was not intended in 1868. From Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, every constitution written since the end of World War II includes a provision that men and women are of equal stature. Ours does not. There is public interest in equal rights. We have a petition with 613 signatures asking the Craven County Commissioners 
to demonstrate their support for the proposed amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America, which guarantees equal rights to all citizens, regardless of sex. By passing a resolution demonstrating such support and transmitting that resolution to the legislator of the state of North Carolina. These signatures were obtained during several art walks in New Bern, uh, the Strawberry Festival in Vanceboro, and the Blueberry Festival in Bridgeton. We are here to answer legal questions that were raised at the last commissioner's meeting. We have 11 common legal questions about the Equal Rights Amendment that have been answered by the law firm of Winston and Strong. What does the ERA do and why is it important? The U.S. Constitution does not guarantee equal rights for women. According to the late Justice Scalia, certainly the Constitution does not require discrimination on the basis of sex. The only issue is whether it prohibits it. It doesn't. The ERA would change that. It would guarantee that equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. It would apply, for example, if the government passes a discriminatory law or takes female assault victims less seriously than male victims or imposes a tax that disadvantages women in particular or denies female soldiers an equal chance to defend their country and move up in the ranks, the ERA would stand in the way of those and other discriminatory state actions. Why is the ERA necessary in light of the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause? The 14th Amendment says that no state may deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The Fifth Amendment applies to the same principle to the federal government. But those protections do not apply to sex in the same way they apply to race or national origin. Today, when a court considers a challenge to a law that discriminates based on sex, it will uphold the law as long as it bears substantial relationship to an important government purpose. This is called intermediate scrutiny. The ERA would, would require strict scrutiny, the same test that applies to discrimination based on race and national origin. Under that test, the law must be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest, and it must be the least restrictive means of doing so. This means that the court would strike down the law if the goal behind it is not appropriate and compelling, or if there is a different way to accomplish it. And we'll continue. Thank you. Linda Moore. <clears throat> How would the ERA differ from the protections already provided under the law? Name there are a variety of... Your name and address. I'm sorry. Linda Moore, 4442 River Shore Drive, New Bern, North Carolina. There are a variety of local, state, and federal laws that prohibit discrimination. For example, Title VII is a federal law that prohibits employers from discriminating based on sex, race, color, national origin, or religion. It protects employees who work for corporations over a certain size, as well as federal and state employees. Title IX is a federal law that, with certain exceptions, requires any school that receives federal funds to give students equal opportunities regardless of sex. The ERA addresses discrimination from a different perspective. It would prohibit discrimination by the government, including in statutes, regulation, employment, and law enforcement. What about the deadlines for the ratification that expired in 1982? The ERA was ratified in 35 states before the deadline imposed by Congress. Last spring, Nevada became the 36th state. In May of 2018, Illinois became the 37th. One more ratification is needed to reach the threshold set by the Constitution. Congress created the deadline, so it has the power to remove it or to extend it as it did in 1979. The Supreme Court has held that it is up to Congress, not the courts, to decide how to deal with the timing of ratification, as in Cole versus Miller, 1939. A decision to remove the deadline should be analyzed the same way. Didn't some states undo their ratification? What is the impact of that? It is true that five of the states that ratified the ERA later passed resolutions attempting to limit or rescind their prior ratifications. 
but historically, resolutions like these have not prevented the prior ratification from counting towards the threshold. When the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, Congress declared it to be effective even though two states had passed resolutions attempting to rescind. The Supreme Court has said it will not second guess this kind of determination. Again, Coleman versus Miller, 1939. Although one court held in 1981 that a state did not have the power to rescind its ratification of the ERA, the Supreme Court vacated the decision after the ERA deadline had passed and the appeal to the Supreme Court had become moot. As of today, there is no case law holding that a ratification can be undone. So if 38 states ratify the ERA, what happens next? Congress can take action to remove it, extend or waive the earlier deadline. There is already a bill proposed that would do this. It could also express a view about the attempts to rescind the ratification in five states. And I'd just like to comment that an earlier um, speaker said there's no need for it. That's not true. My rights are not protected as they are for men. Sandra Wheeler. Good evening. Sandra Wheeler, 1207 Longview Drive, New Bern, North Carolina. Opponents of the ERA have said that it would prohibit any distinction based on sex and would overturn laws that benefit women. Is that true? No. The government would still be able to s draw a distinction based on sex if it passes strict scrutiny, as was described before. But most of the laws that people think of as benefiting women, like social security regulations, estate laws, laws requiring child and spousal support, and so on, are actually already sex neutral. And for those that are not, legislators would have two years after the ERA is enacted to add broader, broader language like spouse rather than wife. Opponents of the ERA say that if it passes, states will lose their power to legisl legislate about family law, sex crimes law, and other laws impacted by gender. Is that true? No again. The ERA will not take any power away from states, except the power to make it unnecessary, unnecessary distinctions based on sex. Isn't this all about changing the law on abortion? No. The Supreme Court has held that the Constitution already protects the right to abortion. Roe versus Wade, Supreme Court, 1973. And in North Carolina, ratifying the, a federal ERA will not change state law at all. So it will not lead to any change in state laws relating to abortion. One anti-ERA organization has said that passing the ERA would require removing gender designations from bathrooms, locker rooms, jails, and hospital rooms. Is that true? No. There is no reason to think that passing the ERA would have those kinds of effects. Other states, such as Illinois, have had equal rights guarantees in place for decades, and it has not eliminated separate women's and men's best restrooms. Thank you. Linda Monk. Good evening, I'm Linda Monk, 105 Partridge Drive, New Room 28562. Nice to meet my commissioner. I would like to speak here on behalf of the Equal Rights Amendment, especially since 38 years ago when I entered Harvard Law School, I was opposed to it. I didn't think it was necessary. I thought that the 14th Amendment was gonna be extended to fully protect men and women fully, equally under the law. And certainly that's where the court decisions were headed. We had the decision that said that a officer's spouse, male, was entitled to base housing because his spouse was female officer. We've had those precedents. 
So the question is, as some people would, would say, why do we need an Equal Rights Amendment? And I would say, actually, that part of the reasons that we need an Equal Rights Amendment have to do with protecting young men. I see right now in my family, in my experience, where fathers are expected to give a check, but then they're not given their custodial visitation. And there's no equality under the law for that. And I believe that families are important. I believe that a child deserves both parents. And that just because one parent, perhaps according to a very old stereotype, that the male is supposed to write a check where the female is supposed to be custodial, I don't think that's fair to families. I don't think it's fair to little boys. I don't think it's fair to little girls, to daddies or mamas. So that's one of the areas where I could see that th this amendment is necessary. As I said, when I started Harvard Law School 38 years ago, I didn't believe it was necessary. And men and women, as you know, both support the Equal Rights Amendment. It's not just women only. It's equality under the law. And I'm proud to say that I went on to be a constitutional scholar. I've written several books about the Bill of Rights in the 14th Amendment and the U.S. Constitution that I'm also proud to say have been praised by liberals and conservatives alike. And so I take very gravely your responsibility here. I wouldn't ask you to do something that I think was meaningless. That would be disrespecting democracy. What I'm asking you to do is to please be on the right side of history. Now, an earlier speaker referenced 1789 when North Carolina did ratify the Constitution with a Bill of Rights, and I'm proud that they waited that long to do it because that's how we got our Bill of Rights. I'm proud of North Carolina's stand there. And I ask us to stand up to that history of protecting rights again, that equality of rights under the law now, that's not saying what anybody's religious beliefs need to be. It's saying under the law, equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex, male and female alike. Thank you so much. Got one. Ms. Truitt. Hi. You just give it to me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, not a problem. My name is Valeria Truitt. I live at uh, 2407 Bryce's Creek Road, Newburn. And I have one more question from the list uh, to address. So try to take yourselves back to question number 10, and here's question number 11. Isn't it true that adopting the ERA won't erase the gender wage gap? And that is absolutely true. The ERA alone would not erase the gap, wage gap because it would apply to the United States and any state, but not to private employers directly. It might stop the government from rolling back anti-discrimination laws, but it will not automatically make them stronger. So in the fight for equality, there will be plenty left to do. We trust that these questions and answers will reassure you that supporting the Equal Rights Amendment is the right thing to do. We have been fighting for passage of this amendment for many years, and we are ready to move on to the next phase, implementation. We don't expect ratification by the North Carolina General Assembly to suddenly bring equality under the law to everyone. We do believe that the ERA will ensure that laws in every state will be enforced based on equal treatment of all citizens, regardless of gender, which currently is not the case. Over the past year, we have told you our personal stories of being subject to discrimination because we were women, from being denied jobs we were trained and qualified to do, to being denied credit in our own names, to being paid less for doing a job than a male employee doing the same job, and you have agreed that such treatment is unfair. Today, you have the opportunity to state publicly where it matters that you believe women should be treated equally under the law by passing this resolution supporting the ERA and submitting it to the North Carolina General Assembly. 
Don't blow it. <laughs> Ray Griffin. God bless America. Amen. Uh, Ray Griffin, Vanceboro, North Carolina, the heartbeat of Craven County. Last week, y'all hashed this thing around about the ERA for I don't know how long beats part of the meeting, and it started right out where we ended up, nowhere, to bring it back over again. Now, the ERA amendment, I've heard them all talk, but the ERA amendment that we know, it says, is a proposed amendment to the United States Constitution designed to guarantee equal rights for all American citizens, regardless of sex, it seeks to end legal distinction between men and women in terms of divorce, property, employment, and other matters. I asked you and I asked each commissioner what is it they are exactly looking for. This covers everything, employment, property, the whole works. What are they looking for? What do they want that the man cannot have or they can't have? Or what's the distinction they're looking for? To me, I want to know from y'all what exactly are they looking for. I, all I can get is just civil rights and odds and ends. But anyhow, there's a story of, when I work, I'm working with men all the time, so I deal with men most of the time. Been in the prison system since 97. That's about 20 some years. But we, it's like I was walking through the prison with the warden. And we're getting to a point where we're, there's a rubber room there. And there's a guy beating his head all against up on the wall and he's going crazy and he's just beating his head up and up and down the hall. And so I asked the warden, I said, well, what is wrong with him? He said, well, there was a lady named Jackie. Jackie said uh, he wanted to marry her, and he was in love with her. And anyhow, Jackie wouldn't marry the lady. Jackie uh, uh, wouldn't have, would marry the man. Jackie wouldn't have nothing to do with the man. So the story goes on. I go a little bit further, and there's another rubber room. And here's the guy, bless his heart, in this other room, beating his head up against the wall, jumping up and down and shouting and carrying on. And I looked at him, and I said, what is wrong with this man? He looked at me and said, you know that woman, Jackie, I was just talking about? said, he married her. So that, that's how it's going. Now, we have, have some women that will just drive you absolutely crazy. But I looked this up, and it says that this is a civil rights movement that advocates equal rights for gay men, lesbian, bisexual, and trans seeks to eliminate sodomy laws, bearing homosexual acts between consenting adults, and calls for an discrimination. It says that LBG Americans will hopefully soon find themselves in the same boat as women are today, not yet equal, where the Equal Rights Amendment is necessary. The ERA may lead to same-sex marriage and women being drafted into the military. I know I've talked with my people at the church in different ones, and a lot of them don't even, they're happy with the life they have. They don't even like women's lib, and I'm not discriminating against women. They all have equal rights. I love them to death. I have to because that's what my Bible says to do. But anyhow, I am saying that there are many people out there that oppose this or do not like this, as many of all that are trying to get something going. So that's my question. What is it exactly that they are trying to get, trying to decide what they ha do not have that a man has? So that's my question I asked you today. And I would like to know, because I, I deal with men all the time. Uh, I, I deal with them, but I mean, I deal with a lot of women in the prison too, but I mean, mostly this, I deal with men. So tell me, uh, answer that. I've heard all these talk about, but you see what, he, what, him, what the amendment says. It says the laurel distinction between men and women just in terms of divorce, property, employment, and other matters. So they have everything. They've got it all. They've even admitted. They said that, talking about sex. It says right here. They've got it all. Amen? All right, so y'all tell me what the difference is. I would like to know. Amen? Jody Loans. Jody Lones, 202 Cindy Lane, Havelock. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this being a, mo a moot point, but I just want to say that you guys showed us why it's a point in the last meeting. It's a point because we don't have equal rights, and you guys can come up here and you can treat women's rights as a political game, and that's why we want to see the ERA pass. Thank you. Bill Harper.
gonna get this one wrong. I'm just gonna say Mr. or Mrs. Clark. <laughs> Clark. Johnny Clark. Johnny, Johnny Clark? Yeah, here. Bill, come out. I don't know what happened to him. He's it next time. Good evening. My name is Johnny Clark. I live at 5560 Highway 55 West Coast City, North Carolina. Well, I'm sure I won't be someone that's liked before tonight and say we're with, but I am not for this bill that they're talking about. I have a wife and she's a lovely person. And she herself would tell you that as far as she's concerned, she has all the rights she needs. Amen. And she loves her husband, who is a independent Baptist preacher. So I'm gonna read some scripture to you tonight. Someone said it's not a biblical thing. And it may not be a biblical thing, but I'm gonna read some scripture to you tonight anyway. It's found in Romans chapter one, starting with verse 18. Now, if I don't get through with the verses, let me just go ahead and say all right off the bat. In my opinion, this is nothing but a back door for the liberals and the socialists to get in something else. <laughs> Mark my word. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men to hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause God gave them up Unto vile affections from even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to those things which are not convenient. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. All you gotta do is look around this country, and we live in that same type of situ in that same type of society today. And why? Because we have forgotten God in just about everything that we do today. Now, I have nothing against women. Matter of fact, I love women. I married a woman. So ladies and gentlemen tonight, whatever your discussion may be, make sure you do the right thing in the sight of God, not in the sight of all these people. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Tiger Gonzalez. Good evening, Commissioners. Tyker Gonzalez, 125 Turkey Quarter Creek Road, Cove City. Two years ago, you all were aware of citizens' complaints about the attitudes of personnel in our animal shelter. This board then decided to implement classes for the staff on how to work with the public. 
As you all know, we then discovered other issues concerning our animal control department, including a lack of accurate record keeping for complaints, getting the department to respond to calls for animals in need, some that went completely unattended, a public outburst from the animal control supervisor on social media calling the new ordinances words I can't repeat and showing dissension to this board who put it in place. In December 2017, our county animal shelter received a report from the state inspector which deemed many areas of our shelter unacceptable, one of which was ventilation in the cat room, which is still a major problem in, even with the one million plus expansion, citing, quote, the cat room is without adequate ventilation and airflow. The ceiling vents are dirty and the exhaust fan does not work. One of the vents is coming out of the ceiling. I'm told the building maintenance comes regularly to change out the filters, end quote. Yet another issue stated roaches passing in and out of the cat room walls. These things should never have been an issue. This board then approved two new full-time positions along with the passage of the new ordinances, understanding our county was in dire need of better animal control overall. A first new time, first time director was hired along with the cruelty investigator and the supervisor resigned. I tried countless times to meet with these individuals with no return calls. I have reported cases that have come to our website on Cruelty and Craven and tried to call for updates, still no return calls. The Humane Society has tried to make contact with them, no return calls. A case I reported involving horses on June 25th has not been visited as of the end of July, a month after the complaint was called in. The environmental health director told me last week the case was not even in the computer to be investigated, but he told the receptionist personally to put it in, again a month after it was called in. He then told me the investigator would call me, still no call. Another ongoing situation in our county with documented problems since 2005 was not only ignored, but the incoming message about it was ripped up and thrown away by the new cruelty investigator and was never visited. The new director then resigns. As it turns out, it seems as if his hiring was an enormous mistake. I have a recording from a case he and the new investigator went out on where he states he was, quote, sworn law enforcement. Not in Craven County he wasn't, that's impersonating an officer. Then he goes out and lies, speaking, saying that he spoke with me and that I, by name, was trying to force his hand. The new investigator then suggests they get a game cam so they can charge me and Cruelty and Craven for trespassing. Evidently, these two know nothing about public view laws. So it's okay to de destroy a citizen complaint that comes in because citizens report to the Humane Society and Cruelty and Craven. But when they do decide to go on a call, they badmouth, put others in danger by giving out names, then give misguided advisement. How is that possible? In another area, state euthanasia percentage reports show um, Cra Craven County came in first in 2015 and 16 with the highest percentage of euthanasia compared in both populations and proximity. 77% of all intakes were euthanized in 2015, 71 in 2016. Statewide, we are number three out of 81 counties reporting and number four out of 73 counties who reported in 2016. All of this proves many things. First and foremost, that our animal control department is out of control and it has been for decades. Blatant mismanagement, organizational priorities, and lack of adoption programs are what has caused all of these problems. The only way to fix this is to fix the overall management. Please don't let all the hard work our community and this board has accomplished go to waste by allowing this to continue. We are charged with being good stewards with what we have been given and we are failing miserably with animal control. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Special. Mike Speciali, 803 Stately Pines Road, New Bern. Uh, I'm not going to not going to debate the merits and demerits of uh, equal rights for women. Obviously, everybody sitting here, I know you guys well enough to know that we all, everyone, probably everyone in this room, believes that that women should have equal rights. The question is, why are we here? Are we here to support the concept of equal rights for women? And if that's the case, I know that all of us do. So it doesn't make sense for us to even go through the motions here. But if we're here to support a theoretical amendment, uh, then we still we really shouldn't be here uh, because we have no idea what is there. There is no amendment. There is no constitutional amendment to support. The amendment died in 1982. Alice Paul in 1921 submitted an amendment to Congress in 1923, Equal Rights Amendment. 
and she submitted it every year, or every Congress, there has been one since 1921, there's, or 23, so there's been one submitted by her or someone else every session, and nothing's ever happened on it. We heard, we heard uh, people come up here and say, some of the proponents, and say, well, it won't do what the opponents are saying. It's not going to make you have to get rid of the male-female uh, bathrooms and this and that. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't fall for that, okay? We've got, we've got cities in this country banning straws, banning big gulps. Uh, we've got some of the craziest stuff going on, so don't, don't underestimate what this bill will do. If you haven't read, the, read it, basically, uh, the one from, that died in 1982 says, uh, where'd it go? Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. There are no states that uh, discriminate against women. We just passed a minimum wage law in North Carolina for state employees. They now get $15 an hour, $15 an hour. There was nothing in the bill that said males only get $15 an hour. Everybody gets it. Every bill that we pass is for male and female. It's for everybody. And so we have to understand that. So my point here is there is no amendment. And Congress cannot bring it up. They did extend it for three years back in, this, uh, in the 70s, in 79, and there was questions then. There were constitutional scholars and, and legal folks who said that they couldn't do that after the fact. They do have the authority to restrict it to seven years. We had an amendment. I know part of the uh, argument was we have an amendment that was three, 203 years to pass, but there was no end date put on that. Congress didn't put an end date. It was one of the original Bill of Rights, which wasn't passed until 1991. But it wasn't passed until 1991 by the state of Michigan. Bottom line is there is no amendment. Congress is going to have to propose an amendment they're going to have to get uh, uh, two-thirds of their membership on both houses to pass the amendment. Then they send it to the states. And then we've got to start all over again and get 38 states because it will be a new amendment. They cannot resurrect the old one. Doesn't matter what arguments you hear about people who believe themselves to be legal scholars or not, okay? We've got a whole team of, of attorneys up there uh, to draw on. And uh, this thing is dead. So if they bring it back up, that would be the time to consider it. But right now, when you have no amendment, there are, there are four amendments in the General Assembly that were put in. Uh, to, they're, they're essentially the same, but uh, two groups of people put them in, and they put two of two each. One of them had some money attached to it. Those uh, are basically state an act to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Because that amendment is dead, these bills went nowhere. They are dead. And if they get submitted next time, they will die as well. Vote no. Tamara Leonard. Tamara Leonard. Tamara. Mr. Leonard, right, but that's you. thank you for trying. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. My name is Tamara Leonard. I reside at 921 Bryce's Court in New Bern. And I would like to cite a report that was published on July 18th of 2018 by the Congressional Research Service after your July 2nd meeting was held. It is called the Proposed Equal Rights Amendment Contemporary Ratification Issues. This is a even-handed both sides because it came from the Congressional Research Department and it cites the pros and the cons of this amendment, and many of the arguments that we have witnessed here tonight. The, um, Mr. Speciali just mentioned the uh, Madison Amendment, and that was the 27th Amendment to the Constitution. And I have to bring your attention to the fact that it's a questionable model to revive the proposed Equal Rights Amendment. Unlike the proposed amendment, it was not encumbered with two ratification deadlines. As he stated but prior to me, there was no time limit on that amendment. Moreover, it is argued that Congress has generally ignored the provisions of that amendment, the 27th, since its ratification because it had to deal with giving themselves pay raises. So my point is, because I don't want to rehash it, everybody's talked about time limits and things like that. 
The bottom line is North Carolina failed to pass the ERA in 1973, 1975, 1977, 1979, 1981, and 1982. Also note that North Carolina had an 11-year trifecta from 1999 to 2010 when the Democrats had control of the governor's mansion and both houses of the General Assembly. They could have brought up this ratification during that 11 years. Why did that not happen? So why now? Why now? Why is it important in 2016, 2017, and 2018? This amendment is 46 years old. It belongs to another time in history. The resolution before you, as I said, cites the 27th, which had no time limit. Voting no on this amendment does not apply that you do not believe in equality for women, men, or anyone else. Voting no believes, it signifies that you believe in the Constitution of the United States. This bill needs to be sent back to Congress. As Mr. Spashali said, every single year there are new updated revisions to this bill presented to the Congress. That's the way to take action. I do not, I ask you to take the emotion out of this equation and vote based on the facts. Thank you very much for your time. Catherine Stash. Good evening, gentlemen. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Usually my voice is quite loud, but uh, this just isn't my thing normally. Uh, I just, yes, sir. Catherine Stash, 211 Easterly Drive, New Bern. Okay, I have a couple of articles here. I'm not going to read all of them, much less one of the, they both happen to be, um, Op-eds. One is from the New York Times, which we all know leans right, right? Okay. The title of this one is the Supreme Court has delivered on many of the ERA's promises by Mary Ann Chase, who is the Arnold I. Shore Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. <clears throat> I'm going to cut some of the superfluous stuff. And she said, I wonder how Phyllis Shapley felt when she realized that everything she warned the Equal Rights Amendment would legalize, women in combat and on high school sports teams, same-sex marriage and adoption of children by gay couples, mothers paying child support to fathers who did child care, even unisex toilets had come to pass anyway. The struggle, thank you, the struggle over ratification was not as decisive a battle as many of the combatants might have thought. Indeed, the current constitutional law of sex discrimination is almost exactly what ERA supporters in the 1970s hoped for from the ERA and what Shafley feared. This is no small measure thanks to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, now a Supreme Court Justice, but in the 1970s she was a litigator for the American Civil Liberties Union Women's Rights Project. Ginsburg won her first Supreme Court case striking down sex distinctions in law and just about the same time as Shafley began her anti-ERA campaign. Over the four decades, the Supreme Court has followed Ginsburg's lead and consistently interpreted the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause to hold unconstitutional any sex distinctions in law or in the government action based on what Ginsburg was to call, quote, overbroad generalizations about about the different talents, capabilities, or preferences of males and females, unquote. The very sorts of stereotypes that Phyllis Shapley spent a lifetime unsuccessfully trying to enshrine in the law. This does not mean that feminists have won the war. However, only that the struggle over ERA, or some who editorialize in favor of continuing to pursue it. The ERA itself would not have eliminated any pay differentials between men and women, guaranteed family paid leave, or increased the percentage of women in legislative bodies, although we have a lot. Ordinary legislation like the Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the Pregnancy Discrimination Act 
did more for women's economic opportunities than a ratified ERA likely would have. What the ERA promised was simply that government would no longer deny or abridge, quote, equality of rights under the law on account of sex, unquote. A majority of the Supreme Court has essentially already delivered on this promise. I would like to ask each of you gentlemen there again to take any emotions out of this. This law is past its time. If we resurrect it, we can resurrect others as well. How far back do you want to go? What other things do you want to revisit? That's my question. When, when is no just no? When can we let this? What, is, what do I have now that I didn't have then? Lots of things. What don't I have? I can't really think of a thing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that concludes citizens' petitions. Thank you. Uh, before we continue with the agenda, I'd like to take uh, Ch Chairman's privilege. And uh, we have a young man in the audience. His name is Filippo Perry, who was chosen to represent Craven County uh, as the, in the Boys and Girls Club. Can you stand up? Uh -huh. <laughs> Next is the consent agenda, uh, which consists of the minutes of July 2nd, the DSS budget amendment, additional crisis funds, and tax releases and refunds. Do I have a motion to move? Second. Okay. Those in favor, uh, uh, roll call, please. Certainly. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Chairman Moore? Yes. We have uh, Craig Singleton, director of the Equal Rights Amendment. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Had too much Equal Rights Amendment good. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> For the workforce development community. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Greg Singleton, 2504 North Hills Drive, New Bern, North Carolina. Um, I want to give thanks for the opportunity to stand before you. Commissioner McCabe, Commissioner Sampson, uh, Chairman Mark, Commissioner Liner, Commissioner Jones, Commissioner Steve Tyson. My role at Craven Community College as the Director of Workforce Readiness is to focus on three areas. Those three areas will be the unemployed, underemployed, and as my role with the Craven Pamico Reentry Council and me being an actual living vessel of the second chance, my focus is on our returning citizens that enter back into Craven from prison or jail. I knew taking over this role that we needed to equip our citizens with the tools to be successful in the job market while creating a vetting process for our employers. This is what birthed the program called the Job Readiness Boot Camp. It's a six-day program that is put together that measures students in more than just one area. One of the areas that we make sure that we measure them in, of course, is the success rate. And I did receive a compliment from the gentleman on our 36% of all students that complete the Job Readiness Boot Camp obtain employment. That is, that's huge, that's huge. Well, not everybody is at the same point of their life, so we also measure individuals based on how many applied for jobs, how many got interviews, and of course, how many are working on their GED or actually rolling their, their learning into uh, full-time courses. But we needed a place, as it says in the Bible, when you're hungry, did you feed me? And as an instructor at Craven Community College, I heard a lot of growling stomachs during the time when people are trying to learn. So I was able to shake hands and partner with uh, RCS, Juliet Rogers, and their entire board of directors. So now not only do we have a facility, we also provide lunch every day of this boot camp. Now the areas that was presented to you in which we measure, we also pay very close attention in three other areas, punctuality, 
showing up ready to work, as well as participation. These are the three major elements that I took away when I met with the number of businesses in Craven County, what they wanted to see. Well, due to the overwhelming success of the Job Readiness Boot Camp, I'm proud to announce that I was invited uh, to meet with Judge Mack in his chambers. And now we have a contract which gives our county judges the option, opposed to sentencing someone to perhaps prison or community service, they can now be sentenced to the Job Readiness Boot Camp. This is, this is, a, this is a great thing where we give them the option of community service versus education. And I want to stress the point that even though I believe in second chance, I'm a vessel of second chance, the job readiness boot camp is just not for ex-offenders. Uh, Ms. Davida Strayhorn, I know she's in here somewhere. Uh, Ms. Davida Strayhorn re came back to Craven County, but not as an ex-offender. She came back looking for a job opportunity. She went through the job readiness boot camp, and she also went through our basic computer class. I'm proud to announce that I offer her an opportunity, and now she's one of the instructors for the job readiness boot camp. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Make no mistake, this young lady holds a degree in history and smart as a whip. So we are proud, because what we need is someone that have walked that walk of unemployment or underemployment. They can advocate to that individual better. So I'm very proud to have Ms. DeVita a part of our Craven Community College Job Readiness Boot Camp team. Thank you, DeVita. Thank you. When I took over the seat being at Craven Community College, I, in working with ex-offenders, I met an older gentleman who was so excited. He was getting ready to start working on his GED. I mean, he came to me, Mr. Singleton, I'm, I'm getting ready to do it, yes. Well, about a week later, the community college found out about his criminal background. And due to our early college, and you know, not wanting to take high risk, he had to be dismissed from the GED program. This, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody get crushed but it's dangerous. This is what prompted the meeting that took place on all April the 17th with the Craven Pamico Reentry Council. And if you're here, please stand. The Craven Pamico Reentry Council, District 3 of Probation and Parole, District 3, which covers Carteret, Pamico, and Craven County, Uptown Training Center, if you would please stand, and Craven Workforce Development in the Basic Skills Department. Let me share with you what took place, which birthed the process from court to accessible education. Regardless of what your crime is, we're able to provide adequate education based on this person's background. Now, I will be the first to say that not every place is for everybody, so we needed to create a path that created education. And you'll see before you, uh, commissioners, a three-step process, which includes probation and parole and the Craven Pamico Reentry Council to guide that person to adequate education. The first location, depending on their criminal background, is on the soils of the community college. The second option, depending on their crime, would be with Uptown Training Center. The third location, we don't call it a catch-all, but for the sake of conversation, it is a catch-all, is RCS through Craven Community College providing that GED instruction, which means no one, no one is left behind. Mm -hmm. The third area I would like to address is the progression of the Craven Pamico Reentry Council. You should have a piece of paper that looks like this. I'm sorry, not you guys. But anyway, what happened when we became a funded reentry council, we were asked to enter into the state database. And that database is called CART, standing for Community Automated Reentry Tool. And this will be the system that we will do all of our intakes, how many offenders we help, what area we help them in, their progression. Well, 
thanks to the state, we get a call on June of 2018 to cease all actions of the CART database. Bow, talking about a hit in the stomach, but that's okay. Because of our resilient case managers, we were able to move into a mechanized environment. So what we have before you is one month of what the reentry council has done. And in short terms, we've enrolled 35 and we have 50 active cases in one month. Allow me to progress further. Now, if we wanted to look at the raw data, the raw data of the performance of the reentry council since we've been funded starting operation February of 2018 till July 20th, 2018, we have performed 181 intakes and with a whopping waiting list of 2058. 258. Thank you, Cora. <laughs> well, before switching over to the state's database, CART, we had our own database. I and two of the case managers will be meeting with Gary Corden to upgrade our database so that we never have to be dependent on the state database ever again. We will hold our own destiny in our hand. As a matter of fact, I was just in Raleigh on Thursday, and they invited us to submit our RFP for the database that is used throughout the state. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? Um, I want to talk about the steward of the money that we received, which was $225,000. We have spent to date, which is the state RFP that we won, $116,102.62 to date, which we have a remaining balance of $108,897.38. We are listed as the top performing reentry council throughout Eastern North Carolina. It is imperative that I share with you the direct impact of us being awarded by the state. One, it provided three jobs with a payroll expenditure of over $61,000. We also have a line item of over $54,000 that go back to help our offenders in their return in the areas of employment, child care, life skills, vocational training, transportation, education, mentorship, basic needs such as hygiene, things of that nature, and one of the most highly high areas that we need assistance in is housing. And we've been able with the support of Wash Away Unemployment and a number of our other vendors to provide adequate housing. I mean, picture getting out of prison without a location. Kind of hard to find a job. Outstanding, what well, we've done awesome in that area. Uh, also, the indirect ripple is now that we have a vetting process through the job readiness boot camp, employers are much willing to take a risk now because we've had an opportunity to look at that individual for six days opposed to a 45 one hour interview. And again, we're looking at those areas of being punctual, being ready to perform and participate. What that does, of course, it decreases the risk factor of our employers, which means they create more job opportunities, which, of course, it uh, stimulate our economy here in the county. We are also the go-to reentry council that assists now Carteret, Jones, oh, I digress. We are assisting Carteret County, Green and Lenore, and Wayne County, who is trying to come online now with their reentry council. So not only is Craven Pamico Reentry Council leading the way, we're sharing the knowledge that we have obtained. In my conclusion, the world of reentry is a very challenging area, especially not just reentering from prison, we're talking about reentering back into the job market. As a matter of fact, if you were to have a conversation with Jones Onslow Reentry Council, they would tell you that reentry is a very tough business. November 14, 2017, Jones and Oslo Reentry Council was awarded $225,000 just as we were. But unfortunately, this past June 2018, 
Jones Onslow Reentry Council had to close their doors due to operational and financial reasons. Though this work is a ministry, it stills require accountability in all areas from operation to finance. This is a business that requires support from the community and the elected officials as you have done. With this willingness set aside all political parties, our willingness to foster a relationship with organizations that already exist. It is so important that we continue this work to help the unemployed, the underemployed, and those that are returning from prison. As Mr. Dacey once said, sitting from his chair, this is the right thing to do. This we will continue to do. I would be remiss if I did not pay special homage to Juliet Rogers and RCS. For them, we're able to provide lunch every day. Because of RCS, we're able to uh, have classes at their location. And because of RCS, our case managers now have a home to call their own that we do intakes. This is a collaboration that's important. It's a collaboration we continue. And you know, I'm so blessed to work at Craven Community College because they allow me to do this. And I appreciate your support to allow me to do this. My dean is out there, Robin Matthews. I told him I was coming before the judges today and I told him I needed a little backing. So he came on out to support me. Again, we're gonna continue to work. And if there's no questions from the board, I want to, yes, sir. Yeah, I have one. Uh, how, how long have this organization been organized? The Craven Pamlico Reentry Council has been organized here in Craven County under my leadership uh, for two and a half years, sir. Two and a half years. Now, this law was passed in 2006. Mm. It took us this long to get started. <laughs> and I'm very appreciative what you all have done for this county because of the dearly needed. Yes. <laughs> we spend more money in the prison system, in the jail system, than we can spend in this program. Yes. We couldn't even spend the amount of money we spend in this county on getting prison in and out of jail. Amen. So I'm thankful. Now you talking about saving taxpayers money. Oh gosh. This save taxpayers money. Lots of money. And it's good to be on this side of it. Again, if you have friends and family that's looking for employment, please allow us to provide them with the tools to be successful. Again, it's not just for ex-offenders, it's people with college degrees. Master degrees have been in this program. But we want to also have an open arm to accept second chance, brothers just like me. Thank you humbly for the opportunity. continue its discussion from July 2nd meeting in regards to the adoption of Equal Rights Amendment resolution. At that time, we had asked the attorney to give us an opinion. Uh, you all have had an opportunity, I believe, to read it over. Are there any questions? Sorry, I didn't read the opinion. Can someone print a copy and give to me, please? I can give you a copy if you'd like. See, you got right here. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's quite lengthy. Jim, would you uh, want to give an overview of, of it for the commissioner? Hmm? 
Good evening, commissioners. Uh, at your request, we provided to the board um, a two different documents. The first was a rather more detailed, more legal type of analysis of some of the issues that are before you, as well as what was attempted to be a kind of an executive summary, if you will. Obviously, the, the issues involved here are, are very numerous. They're very complex, and it's almost, once you start down this process, it's almost like a binary tree. You start out with no one, and if A, then you go off this way, if B, you go off that way. But those two sub nodes, you didn't have sub issues. And so before you know it, you're really way down in the weeds without a lot of clarity and guidance. Um, what I've done is, uh, based upon my understanding of where the board is, is uh, the questions have been, my opinion really addressed, I, I guess, two overall issues. Um, but you can break it down as follows. First of all, has the deadline for ratification expired, uh, notwithstanding the extension? And if it has, is it now moot, or may Congress extend that deadline at this time? I think part two of, of these are the big picture issues. Part two is how many states would be deemed today, sitting here right now, to have passed the ERA as proposed, notwithstanding the issue of five states voting later to rescind their approvals? Um, the one thing I can assure you of is there's no sureties here. This is an extremely complex area. There is no real legal precedence whatsoever to guide us. Now, there may be some facts, there may be some history, and there are even some cases, but I think all those situations and those, that, that background is um, quite candidly distinguishable in this case. And I can go through, I guess, a quick summary of my executive summary at this time where I can answer particular questions, however the board would like to proceed. Uh, how would you like to proceed? <laughs> go over the summary. Go over the summary, Okay. Yeah, first question, I think, uh, the, the, the threshold first question is whether Congress uh, could have validly extended the deadline uh, when it first did so. And, you know, you can look at that as kind of being a moot issue because the deadline as extended was 1982, which has obviously um, passed by many years. But I don't think we can stop it there because it really does touch on the issue as to whether uh, Congress, one, had the authority to extend the deadline in the first place, which then leads into the issue of whether they have that authority now to, quote, resurrect it, if you will. Um, there has been a lot of um, mention of the 27th Amendment, how it took over 200 years from its adoption to its passage, and that was okay, which, you know, supports the position that this is not a moot issue and that it could still be adopted. <laughs> Need to point out that the 27th Amendment had no deadline when it was introduced. The ERA had a very specific deadline which was extended. So I don't believe you can, we can really rely on the history of how the 27th Amendment was eventually adopted to glean what the courts, if you will, uh, would do now. Um, likewise, you've heard quoted a lot the case of Dillon versus Glass and the case of Coleman versus Miller, which do in fact stand for the proposition that uh, the Supreme Court has held in effect that Congress alone determines you know, the reasonableness and the time in which uh, the constitutional amendment can be ratified. But again, I think those cases are very distinguishable here because in both of those cases, the underlying proposed constitutional amendment did not have a deadline. And we're dealing with an amendment as proposed with a sp specific deadline. So I just don't think those cases really give us any guidance either. Um, and as someone else has, um, um, pointed out, there really is no legal precedence on, on this issue. So we're really, there are opinions on both sides, yes and no, but what I'm saying is no one can give you a definitive legal opinion on that issue. The, the final point there is um, there is some question as to whether the deadline is relevant uh, because of the fact that the deadline is in the resolution that Congress passed to start this process, but not in the text of the amendment itself, which can be distinguishable for various reasons. But long and short of it is there is absolutely no legal guidance on that point. So can Congress now retroactively extend um, um, the deadline? Again, there's absolutely no precedence in the, in the cases in the 27th Amendment are not, um, in my opinion, applicable. Um, there is no judicial precedence, though, although I would point out that a federal court, in the case of uh, uh, now versus Idaho, which dealt with the ERA Amendment itself, that court held that Congress did not have the authority to extend 
the deadline when it did so. Um, that was later vacated by the U.S. Supreme Court, not on the merits, but only because the U.S. Supreme Court at that point said, regardless whether they could extend it or not, the, the extension deadline's over, it doesn't have the 38 states, so it's a moot issue. So the, to the extent that that decision was held, you know, it, was, it was vacated for that reason. And we all know how the courts work. We can get different opinions in different jurisdictions. The Supreme Court can overturn you know, the lower courts. So again, the point is even that case really doesn't provide us any kind of guidance or, or safe harbor as to what would happen um, as this progresses. Um, that then leads us, I guess, into the concept of whether how many states are deemed to have passed the ERA amendment. Um, in other words, can states rescind that ratification prior to the final enactment? Again, there's absolutely no definitive answer. Um, the 14th Amendment is cited and has been cited tonight as a proposition that, in fact, uh, a state cannot rescind it because in that situation, uh, two states rescinded their approval. Congress, in effect, ignored that rescission and declare the resolution to be adopted and the, and the constitutional amendment to be adopted. That was action by Congress that was not challenged. As we know, Congress takes actions all the time that are deemed later to be unconstitutional or outside of their authority. So I don't think we can rely on Congress's past conduct to say that's precedence, that's binding going forward. Um, so there is no legal precedence. Again, in the case of Now versus Idaho, the court addressed this issue as well. And in this situation, in that court held that states do have the right to rescind that ratification prior to the ultimate adoption. But the U.S. Supreme Court vacated that again because the question was moot. So what I can tell you with certainty is that there's nothing but uncertainty as to how this <laughs> will proceed. If I, if I may, the one certain thing that you can rely on is that regardless of what happens, if and when the day comes that a 38th state, regardless of rescission, when it passes it, we as a country will experience years of litigation. If we get to 38 states and Congress does nothing, there's going to be litigation. If we get to the 38th state and the other way, there's going to be litigation. Um, so I cannot tell you at this point, as you asked, you know, what is the status of the validity of, of the ERA proposed amendment, nor can anyone definitively tell you what it is at this point in time. Um, so what I'm telling you is we don't know, and I don't think anyone does. Do commissioners have any questions? Attached to the, uh, to the executive summary, like I said, is a little more detailed legal analysis. I would like to make a motion that we would pass on send it up to our legislators and let them decide what they want to do. I make that motion. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Well, let me ask you this. What is he actually asking for? Because we've got two resolutions, if I'm not mistaken, two resolutions in this package. So which resolutions are you putting forward to send to? Asking the, asking the representative to accept this amendment and pass on it, and we can move up that the women will have that equal right. I know, but I'm, what I'm asking, am I wrong in this? There's, there's, two, there's two resolutions in mm -hmm. the package. Which resolution are you looking to pass forward? Well, it doesn't make, as long as both of them support the Seeker Right Amendment. Well, the wording is in there. That's what Let makes me, the difference. May I address this? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, attachment four is two, uh, two different resolutions. One was the one that was presented to the board some time ago by, I believe, a member of the audience. Right. We had a lot of discussion about that. I went through uh, with my staff and found additional, I believe there were three that were cited resolutions from counties. This one was one that actually was approved, I believe, last year by Dare County um, as an example of what another county's actually approved um, by motion. I couldn't find where the one that was presented to you was ever actually approved by county because each one of the three I found were different. I gave you the one that was closest by. That was the Dare County resolution uh, passed in 2017, which is the most recent as well that's been considered. And 
that and was, I just modified this. That was on grade. August the 1st, wasn't it? It was in March of 2017. March of 2017. Well, I would like to have a Dare County one. He wants the Dare County one? That's, that's the second one. Second one, yeah. I'm sorry. The, the first one is the one that was presented to you, and the second one was the one we modified from Dare yeah, County. And we, we only modified it to change it from Dare to Craven. Okay. So the motion is to approve the one from Dare County, and it was second. Do we have any other discussion? Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, I have some things, my, my thoughts, and I'm going to tell you I'm going to vote before the vote's called. Um, I would support the Equal Rights Amendment as written had it been done in the fashion that I believe that the Constitution meant it to be done, and it hasn't been done. So, I mean, a couple of people have spoken here and said it's not our it's not our job to 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 uh, it's not our place to, to pass this resolution. Um, we listened to our attorney; he gave an opinion that was all over the place, and I, I don't think he did that because uh, he was trying to dance around the issue. Because, as we know, he's going to be leaving the country soon. So I, I, don't, I don't think he's uh, doing it to try to dance around the issue. But to me, it's clear that, uh, you know, the legislation would pass, I mean, the, amend, the Equal Rights Amendment was passed by two-thirds, three-quarters, whatever it takes, of three-quarters of the uh, members of Congress, and it was passed by a certain amount of states, but not enough to get the three quarters majority. And the time has lapsed. It's clear the time has lapsed. It was extended one time before the lapse of, occurred. Um, there's equal scholars on both sides that would say that they could extend it. But um, it is clear, according to what I read, that Congress can put a limitation on, on an amendment, a time limitation. Uh, that's been ruled in some of the lower federal courts. Um, I didn't I didn't realize, and I apologize if I didn't have this information that he sent, he sent it in an email, but uh, in the noun versus Idaho, it, it seems to say that Congress did not have the authority to extend the deadline for ratification of the ER. They're saying they didn't even have, to, didn't even have the uh, right to do it. Uh, so we're sitting here with something that we're certainly not qualified to. It, this needs to be hashed out at the Supreme Court of the United States, and why it hadn't appeared before them by now, I don't know. I mean, we can sit here and debate if this is a Democrat or Republican thing or conservative liberal, and uh, I mean, that's not what we do good as boards. That's right. uh, it really needs to be hashed out in the, in the federal court system. And for us to, <coughs> try to put any uh, undue pressure on our legislators when I am of the opinion that this is a settled because the timeline has passed. I haven't seen any ruling in any court. There's some legal scholars I say would, that I think I've read said that they could extend it even though the deadline passed many, many years ago. But I haven't seen any courts rule that. And so with that, I'm not going to support the resolution. But I would support the Equal Rights Amendment. I think the ladies need to go back and get the passed through Congress. If it was passed in the in the 70s and through our uh, Congress, I would certainly think it could pass today. Um, I, I think, as some of the ladies have said, the uh, most of the probably outcomes of the Equal Rights Amendment have already been achieved to a large degree. I think these lady, ladies want it memorialized in the Constitution. I don't see any harm in that. And will it be cause some possible uh, problems? Yes. There'll be lawsuits. There'll be, uh, you know, men suing some women's groups and women suing some men's groups. And um, I, So I do think there'll be some problems, but we will get through it. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Mr. Chairman, I'll read this me me memorandum concerning this. I read all this that they had in here concerning this issue. 
Now, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I've never been to law school. But with my dumbness, I, I still support this act here for the women's equal rights. Now, if a, uh, the state have a problem with it, then let them deal with it. I feel like I've done what I feel that like right. And I think every person have that same opportunity. Anybody else? Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to remind um, our citizens and state for the record once again, um, on March the 5th of 2018 of this year, uh, this Board of Commissioners passed a resolution recognizing the National Women's History Month in Craven County, and we went through all the whereas's, but the last whereas it said further be resolved that the Craven County Board of Commissioners strongly supports the role of women in Craven County and the contributions they have made and will continue to make in building a community that is a better place to live. Um, I'm not saying nobody that's sitting in this audience has said that, but it was addressed to me that we were seven chauvinist men that sat up here that did not recognize the role of women. And we've already passed a resolution um, saying that we did recognize the important role of, of ladies in our society. And um, whether we vote this up or down tonight, I think we've already made that statement that we do support the role of ladies in our society. So that's all I've got to say, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Chairman, I have just a couple more questions because I, I pulled something up here. I'd like some clarification, if it's possible. There's just so many cloudy issues here. Uh, to our attorney, um, you know, I just want to point out, it says, a 1921 Supreme Court decision, Dillon versus Gloss, affirmed that Congress has the power to fix a definite time limit for ratification. Is that, you take that as it says? Yes, sir. Okay, but uh, it says a 1939 Supreme Court decision reaffirmed the power of Congress to fix a reasonable time period for ratification, but also determined that Congress has the power to promulgate an amendment after the final state constituting a three-quarter majority ratified. So um, I'm kind of cloudy on that. Have you read this? Or? Yes, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, right. Again, explain. I mean, it says that Congress has the right, but. Why is it going any further than that? Well, again, in those two cases, there was not an actual deadline set. Um, pause, let me get to my notes. Yeah, those two cases, in effect, held that Congress um, determines what is a reasonable amount of time for passage of an amendment. Um, and, but again, in both those cases, there was not a deadline set with those. And the second case, one of the, the Coleman case, um, to a, s a certain extent, Coleman clarified the prior case by basically saying that it was Congress's decision and Congress's decision alone as to what is a reasonable amount of time. That, in other words, the courts would not intrude once Congress said that. That has been held, though, for the proposition that if Congress were to now say it's still reasonable, those two court cases may, in fact, might have some application now, even though the context is different about no deadlines originally. But if Congress alone has the right to say it's reasonable, and Congress were to now say it's reasonable, notwithstanding the sunset, I mean, I mean, if you take those cases literally, that's not challengeable in a court. Now, if that's what they would hold today, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, it, there, there's no doubt in my mind, though. Uh, and I didn't mean to be flippant when, there's, when I said there's no certainties. It, truly, there are scholars on this, on each side of each issue and sub-issue all the way down. Um, it does seem to me, in my opinion, it was, seems to me that Congress, though, would have to take some type of action to move the ERA forward because there is, in fact, a deadline that has expired. Now, there are some scholars that say that's irrelevant because, as I mentioned before, the deadline is in the resolution that Congress adopted, not in the text that the states have been adopted along Can't the way. Can't scholars try to get before the Supreme Court or whatever court? The U.S. Supreme Court will not hear anything that's hypothetical or advisory, especially something like this. <laughs> and, 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 and I put this in, in the memo, I don't mean, again, I don't mean to, to make light of anything. 
it is a reality that I think that the composition of Congress and or the U.S. Supreme Court at that time will have some bearing on the outcome. There's just no way around that. So, you know, even a guess as to what's going to happen, tell me the makeup of the U.S. Supreme Court, and I'll have a better chance to tell you what I think they'll do, but we don't know. So that's what I'm saying. This thing is completely wrapped up in uncertainty. Okay. Any other questions? I, I just got one. I feel like that finally does something up. I mean, the text you've done a fabulous job. I mean, reading that, you know, made me look as about as stupid as I think I've been in a long time. And everything else out there is figuring out. But I think you, you summed it up pretty much as what Congress will do or won't do. And that's, any, and that's anyone's guess. I mean, the Supreme Court ruling back in 82 saying the issue was mute when they... Utah or Idaho, one of them, rescinded their vote and said, you know, we're not going to rule on it because it's a moot issue because the deadline is passed. You know, it didn't have a fight or anything into it. Uh, if this is something that the state would want to take on and want our support and they're willing to do it, I don't have a problem. I think it's noble and out there for the ERA, but I think we're well over our heads in uncertainties of what we're going to do. It's a piece of paper that you've heard. It's probably not going to be acted on or even looked at. In the last two sessions, they've had it and didn't do anything with it. They set it in the committee, and it didn't come out of committee. There's no issues there, so uh, I will not be voting. In addition to that, uh, we sent a letter asking them to give us information on it, which we never got a return on. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 Those not in favor, say nay. 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 Yeah. Nay. 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 Call the roll. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Jones. No. Commissioner Liner? No. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Chairman oh, excuse Moore. me, ma'am. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> sorry. Is there a deadline on that? Yeah. Chairman Mark. Is there a deadline? <laughs> sorry. Chairman Mark? The answer is the same. What are you saying? What? No. Did you get that? No. No. Uh -huh. Okay, let's go on. Postal Service Department. Jeffrey. Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager, thank you for having me. Um, we bring before why you. We, why don't we take a five minute break? Yeah, yeah. please do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there. Chairman, Commissioners, County Manager, thank you for having me. Um, we bring before you an amendment in line in regards to the crisis intervention program funding and administrative dollars. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Discussion? Let's make Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah. Now, this is, this is state and federal dollars. Federal. This is all federal dollars coming down mm -hmm. to the state, passed down to us. Is yes. That correct? Yes, the Energy Block Grant Program. Okay. Yeah. And I'm this holding the money that I have to sign away. You're holding the money? <laughs> <laughs> like I have a choice. Okay. okay. We have a uh, motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question on that, though. He said it was federal, but it looks like it's actually coming from some of the energy companies. Am I reading that wrong, or well, that's am just, I reading the wrong one? That's some of the name of the programs. We actually didn't get any funding in those specific areas. That's just the name of the line item in the budget. So this okay. is just in the crisis intervention okay. program. thank you. Okay, and we have uh, Sandra on the Embrace Recovery Rally Update. Guys, for letting me 
come mm -hmm. and share with you an update on the Embrace Recovery Rally. Um, as many of you know, the Embrace Recovery Rally is organized by the Community Collaborative for Craven County Children. It's a community organization that's one of their main goals is to prevent child abuse and neglect in our community. Um, and one of the, the leading contributory factors is substance use. And in um, the strategic planning a few years ago on how to address um, substance use and how it's affecting our children and our families and our community, the rally came about. It was um, developed, it was an implementation um, intervention for us to you know, bring awareness to our community. We found that most people were not aware of the opioid epidemic in our community. They weren't personally affected by it, really didn't know. Um, those who were affected by it didn't know where to go to get resources, um, so they were at a loss. Um, and then often people who are dealing with this do not have very much hope that their life is going to change. Um, and so those were our three goals for the rally, was to bring awareness to our community um, about this disease, um, to bring resources into one location. It's held at Union Point Park, which is central in the county. Um, bring those resources so people would know and have access to them. And then the third thing was really to bring some hope um, to our community and those affected by this disease. Um, and I feel like we accomplished all three of those things through the speakers that we had, the information that was provided, and the resources that were available. Um, and so this will be our third year of having the rally. Our goals remain the same, those three. One of the additional things that, um, that's come about with different research is that the stigma associated with the disease of addiction, people are reluctant to speak out, ask for help, they feel um, degraded or ashamed. And so we really want to work on changing the language on how we talk about it and on the stigma associated with it so that we can start saving some lives, those who are still feeling hopeless. And so um, every year at the rally, we have some really great speakers. It is from 2 to 5, Commissioner McCabe, on um, September the 15th. Um, we have great speakers who address different areas of the drug epidemic. Um, this year, we will um, have, you know, again, somebody who's recovered um, themselves share their story of recovery. We have Donald McDonald, who has spoken the last two years, will be here again, who is um, the president and director of addiction professionals in North Carolina, who really speaks and travels all over the state talking about um, the stigma associated with it. He's in recovery himself. Um, he says he's thriving in recovery. He's not just living in recovery. And he wants other people to know that that's a possibility. Um, and also we've reached out. Every year we've um, had someone speak to different things as far as the Good Samaritan Law. Um, health issues related to this epidemic. And this year, we're really hoping to be able to share with the community what Havelock is doing um, with the syringe exchange and the harm reduction program. So we're trying to work on having um, a speaker address that. Every year, we have live music, children's activities, free food. It's a community event. It is, um, you know, it takes the community, really, to deal with this. And our, our uh, I'm going to call it motto, community support equals successful recovery. Um, and we believe that strongly it's going to take everybody. Um, we really need the word out there. There's still many people who don't know where to go or who do not have hope. Um, and so we've had some really um, good community support in regards to sponsorship. Carolina East Foundation, I'm sorry, Carolina East Health System sponsored last year and they're sponsoring us this year. Carolina East Foundation sponsored us last year and also opened up their grant to us this year, so we're waiting on that. Um, Addiction Professionals of North Carolina um, has uh, allowed us to apply for one of their grants, and we should find out this week. Toyota of New Bern and Publix this year have been some of our supporters for this year. So um, we're, we're very pleased with the support that we're getting from the community. Um, any questions? No, that was Saturday. The Saturday, September 15th from 2 to 5 at Union Point. Is, is there a rain day? You're just hoping the first year. going to be no rain after <laughs> I pray there's no rain. The first year we had some rain and there was still a good turnout. People out there with our umbrellas. I mean, it was that important to them that people came in the rain. Um, and so that was so, no, we do not have a rain day. We're, we're praying for good weather. Actually, it was well attended last year. I, I, I had spoke. Uh, yes, you did. And uh, it was really uh, quite a few people there. I was <laughs> shocked that there was that many people there. Mr. Chairman, if yes. I may. Um, Chairman appointed myself to uh, chair the outreach committee for our Craven County Opioid Task Force, and Ms. Sandra came and spoke to our committee uh, last time we met. And um, we talked about your funding and, and how you go about and getting it, and, and when you were there before our committee, you told us you were seeking donations. Um, and one thing that my committee wanted me to come to this board is talk about 
financial support from the county because that's one thing that we as a board of commissioners have been talking about is how are we going to support an ongoing program uh, for awareness about the opioid drug problem that we have in Craven County. So my question to you today, you, since we've talked, it sounds like you've got a lot of donations and that's wonderful. Um, our committee wanted to see if the county would invest some towards materials and so forth. So my question to you is, is have you got what you need to put on a successful rally uh, in getting the message out financially? What does it take financially? Well, we don't have takes you know we there's there's expenses associated with it um, one of the things is obviously awareness is really getting the word out there to the community um, about this event so that takes you know banners and public service announcements and um, materials to get out there um, the collab community collaborative for Craven County children developed a resource brochure and so we need to obviously order more of those to have that available so there's still still a need for funding. I mean, we will be very blessed if we get the Carolina East Foundation. Um, I hope so. Mr. Chair, uh, will, will you know by since the 20th of this month whether you've gotten all of your grants? I'll know by the 10th this week if we got the um, for, uh, Addiction Professionals of North Carolina grant. Um, I don't. Jean can affect us here. I'm not sure when we hear from the foundation. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's going to be the beginning of September. That's how it was last year, and I'll have to go and present um, our request to them, and then they notify us. So I'm hoping, I believe we received it by the 20th last year because our rally was September 30th last year, and we had the funding by then. Did they sponsor you the year before, too? No, we didn't. We didn't apply the year before. Okay. It was our first time, so that we learned a lot. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, um, you know, I, I'd love, we want donations from the community and, and, and to put these events on um, and, and not trying to, to take and, and to throw money at an issue. But um, if we as a, a board of commissioners are going to take serious our role in trying to address the drug problem that we got in Craven County, I personally feel like we need to step up to the plate also in these, in, in these awareness programs because when we present our plan to this Board of Commissioners, um, just well to be ready, we're going to ask for some funding. I mean, there's no way that we can do what we want to do without some funding. We've applied for grants. So far, we've been turned down in everything we've uh, tried to apply for. Um, I'd like to, if the Chairman would entertain and, and accept the motion, I'd like to ask that we take an appropriate $1,000 come out of fund balance to support um, this uh, Embrace Recovery Rally for September the 15th from two to five and that it go towards, um, if we can allocate, towards the materials um, to use and maybe you can take some of your other funding and, and advertising and so forth. I still have a motion. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Yes. Make sure I understand this. The materials are going to be the handouts that's provided by the organization to the audience in relationship to this program child abuse, the substance abuses and stuff like that that's involved and how it dictates. Things that we are trying to do now with our opioid. So you're you're stepping in in areas that we're already trying to get started and going. So to piggyback I guess on, and I'm not speaking for Commissioner Dacey at all, but making sure that what if we're putting funding out there, that we're putting funding out there that's supporting a program that we would, we don't have to support, but we've already taken on because of the epidemic that we have and that we realize that we're trying to get a handle on it. So if that literature that you're putting out there is for that and that's what you're recommending, yeah. It, yes, sir. Okay. okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I just like to say that uh, I've been really involved with drugs, not only in my community, but all over 
to come. And I find that most of our young people come through that cycle. If it's before they are born or after they are born. And we need to give some guidance to our young people especially. All those people that's already on it, we need to help them. And I think that a reentry program is going to help them to find a job and you know, be able to get education. If you, don't, if you don't have no education, you can't get no job. A lot of times you got education, you can't get one. But we, I think the, the reentry program is doing an excellent job, and I think this organization is doing an excellent job. We got to work this thing together because mm -hmm. it affects, I know it affects me, and I believe it affects every family in New Bern or Craven County one way or another. And I'm really in support of doing this for the kids because they need our assistance and the adults. They need our assistance so they can stop us from paying so many taxes. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all you're doing with the task force as well. Emergency service, Stanley Kite. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. At this time, I'd like to call on Nancy Rowland to present to your request to the Township Fix uh, Fire Department uh, for to receive some funds from their fund balance. My name's Nancy Rowland. I live at 408 Lafitte Way in, in uh, News Harbor. I'm the president of Township 6 Fire Department in Carolina Pines. <laughs> uh, the reason I am here tonight is to request the uh, from the board to allow us to get $20,000 of the, our monies that you folks have been saving for us. And the reason we would like this is we need to refurbish our main station. Uh, we have cracks in our walkway in the building and uh, we have covered covered them up at one time, because, but it worked one way, but it didn't work the other way. <laughs> And uh, we would appreciate it if you folks could see to let us have that money. Okay. This comes out of the fund that we hold for them. Mm -hmm. I make a motion to approve. Second. Vote. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if we could, if I could just say that, but I don't know that I've met you before, but I thank you for what you do, spending your time trying to uh, make sure that our fire department is ready in emergencies. And the three folks back there, <laughs> I can't recall all your names, but I've been seeing you since I've been on this board for a long time. And I appreciate the thousands of hours that you guys have put non-paid time, I might say, to uh, make sure that the citizens and that part of the County are, are safe and secure, and, and, and you're there when they need them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just also to remind the board, this came up during our budget process, that I let you all know that this would be coming forward in August, coming out of their funding that we held mm -hmm. due to the mix-up that the bank did on them on their regular checking account they would be coming forward again. It's their money that we've been holding for them year after year, so it has nothing to do with the general fund or anything right. else. It's what they've had their time So now you can spend it. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say, uh, I, re I remember a time ago when I was stranded in an accident coming from on 43. I was, the car turned, it flipped about four times, and, and when it came down, I was on the opposite side of the top side to get out of there. And I kept jumping up trying to get to that door. I couldn't, couldn't reach it. Tall as I am, I still couldn't reach that other door on the other side. And the next thing I knew, here, here's some kind of res here's a rescue squad 
I don't know where it came from, basketball, where it came from, but I know it was there. <laughs> and the overnight door, I was glad to get out of there. <laughs> so they're, they're well worth what they are doing because it is necessity that we help one another when they're in trouble. That's why I'm so willing to help other people because so I've been helped so many times that I, I know I'm not worth it, but, but the Lord that's blessed me to have somebody always come by. Thank you. A uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McCabe? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Chairman Moore? Yes. We thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Chair, just yes. because I didn't hear it, who was the second on that motion? Jen, was it? Mr. Sampson? Okay, yes. thank you. I just didn't hear it. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Go back here. Okay, Department of Matters, Planning, Hurricane Matthew, Recovery, C, D, D, G, Neighborhood Revitalization Grant, uh, Chip Bartlett. Oh, there you are. Hey, <laughs> good evening. Um, again, this the, we were talking about the CDBGNR, our Neighborhood Revitalization Program. Uh, this is a CDBG grant that you're familiar with. We've done quite a few of these over the last uh, few decades. Uh, in this case, it is a housing um, repair or reconstruction program, but uh, the CDBGNR that was awarded to Craven County in the, in the amount of $750,000 is targeted towards Hurricane Matthew victims uh, that have uh, what we call the unmet needs or uninsured damage out there. What we're uh, asking for tonight is to approve the um, Budget, uh, budget ordinance and the project budget ordinance, the budget amendment, um, the resolutions that go along with this program are very similar to the CDBG programs you've seen in the past. This is uh, federal HUD dollars that go through the state through uh, uh, rural economic uh, development and um, we have a budget amount again of $750,000 which is comprised of rehabilitation, 300000 375000 in reconstruction and $75,000 in program administration for a total of 750000 These funds are proposed to, to be used to rehabilitate four structures and to demo and reconstruct two homes that received damage as a result of Hurricane Matthew. Currently, the needs assessment and qualification determination are being completed, so individual recipients have not been chosen at this time. The area of concentration will be the communities of Chips and along River Road in Western Craven County. In order to move forward with the administration of these grant funds, a resolution of support is needed from the Board of Commissioners approving the attached budget ordinance along with the administrative guidelines and policies. Do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, second. Discussion. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. This rehabilitation and um, also reconstruction, are you going to have to, uh, you're obviously going to have to build them to, new, to the new FEMA regulations, right? Were Correct. any of these houses flooded that were not in the 100-year flood zone that you know of? Uh, again, all the, the homes haven't officially been okay, you haven't, you haven't picked them, selected, but a uh, majority, if I'm not mistaken, Don, will, be in the, will be in the flood zone. So you have to lift and, them up correct. if you rebuild or even rehabilitate? Yeah, rehab would include elevating to the two above two foot of freeboard for for Craven County, and it, and if the case if it's not cost effective to rehab, uh, reconstruction would also involve building to that floodplain standard. If I could follow up that question, and Don may be more attuned at answering it, but uh, is there any indication of when, if and when the state will approve the new flood maps? They drew up a few years ago. The, the latest that we've heard within the last month would be sometime in January, but that, that's not 100% from as well. There are some communities that have appealed the map, and they are still dealing with those map appeals in those communities. So it would have to be the appeals process run the course for all the counties and cities before well, they think, would do it to individual counties or cities? I think there is some packaging that the state does 
to a certain uh, areas like maybe communities along the coastal area uh, you know, are going to be coming off about the same time. So I do think that yes, there is some effort uh, underway by the state for economies of scale to to try to release several counties or go through the process at one time with several different communities. So I mean, it's, I, would, I would hope that they would give after they're passed if there was some type of uh, at least period in there where you know before it became effective even though if it was passed because people a lot you know I was in this county it seemed like I remember six or seven hundred people that were not in the flood zone will now be in the flood zone which means they're going to have to have flood insurance if they have a mortgage which can could add we, we did <coughs> look at some of the preliminary data that the state had and we wrote back to them with a series of questions about certain properties that appeared from everything we could see on the topography on the land. It appeared that, the, that they had been put into the program by mistake and out of those that we submitted, um, we did get some of them coming back saying they had reviewed them and withdrawn some of those due to the topographical information. Somehow the model didn't pick up uh, all the data that it should have, should have and coming back to the board uh, once they uh, have actually produced those maps and given us. They, they tentatively said they're going to make some changes. Is it would, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if I'm That's taking right. up. We've been here this long, <laughs> what's another couple of minutes? That's right. Um, would it be possible or practical, uh, Don and, and maybe the county manager, uh, if they had flood? information on the GIS, you know, I know the state has a map, but where it would be readily, if somebody's in the flood zone, it would be on the GIS, because there's times when the, you can't determine if a house is in the flood zone by looking at the flood maps that are online. You can't do it. The way that the state and FEMA have uh, addressed the counties would be to use their official sites. That is the official site and the county site is not considered Therefore, okay. um, there, therefore, that's where in kind of lies the, the issue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner. Um, how many individuals did you have to um, submit applications in this the Chips River Road area for um, rehabilitation, reconstruction? Do you know? There's, there was around 40 total countywide unmet needs applicants if I recall there may have been 12 to 15 um, for in that along Chips Road in that general area actually the, the state is undertaking the input process and to date there's been 44 applicants and that's a, a, like last Wednesday or Thursday 44 applicants for In addition, as Don's mentioned, in addition to the NR program, there's also the DR, the CDBG DR, which is being, um, that's being set up and run by the state. As far as eligibility, they've set up um, intake centers, closest one being Kinston. Mm -hmm. um, so that is another pot uh, of funding for hurricane victims um, that will hopefully service Craven County. So it's, it's a different program. But, this one, uh, like I said, we, we, when we did the application, we focused around off the Chips Road and a couple little scattered site target areas in between. And, and going back to the flood maps, uh, what we do, what we've done generally with these mitigation projects is normally our houses uh, that we deal with are going up. They're going from an 8-foot to a 9-foot elevation or an 8-foot to a 10-foot elevation if the proposed maps come through. But we've always been trying to be proactive and go with the higher of the two so that if the home is funded and it's say eventually elevated, that they're going to meet the higher standard and, and be compliant <coughs> with, with whatever happens with the, with the flood maps. Mr. Chair, have anyone um, in the uh, Hollow Air uh, filed any type of uh, application for this funds? 
I don't have the applicants Nobody. with me, but I'm not, I don't recall any, anyone from Harlow. They can still, if, if there are flood victims out there that had Hurricane Matthew damage, they can still call 211 and, and, and go to these intake centers that the state has set up, any one of them, closest one being Kinston um, right now, and they can go through the process to determine eligibility. So it's not too late for someone that had Matthew damage to apply. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Please explain to me. Which one of these, this one or the one you talked about, the funding-wise is part of the $650 million that the governor is holding on to that hasn't come down? Is this part of any of that, or is that still? The, D, the DR money is, is uh, state money, the, the intake centers. Uh, this is federal. This is, this is from HUD down through the, the state. So this one here is strictly HUD? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we have still got nothing from the state on the six hundred and fifty million that the feds gave him for the for the federal for Matthew, is that correct? Was there something in the paper that we were, they were gonna release that money? They they've been saying for quite some time that they were going to release the money, but they have had the process very uh, very much under control to ensure there is not uh, misappropriation of money. So the application process is like 20 some pages long and uh, it takes a considerable amount of time for the applicant and the person at the state to screen those people to determine if they are eligible or not. It's how we balance the budget. Yeah, well it's a, it's a pity because some of these people are still living in hotels. Yeah. All right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I hate one more question. <laughs> um, the, the termination for qualification. I, I know it's complex, no doubt, but I mean, uh, you're doing it, is that is that right, to determine who would be the recipients? How does that go? As far as the, the households? Yeah. Well, we, we turn, to put out the application, we'll interview the applicant, we'll assess the structure, so it's, it's, a, it's a point system, it's a ranking. Um, and we look at different, the, some of the same population criteria we looked at that the old block grants, so elderly, handicapped, um, uh, it's a 80% or below, it's a low to moderate income program, so uh, how low is the income and the, how many severe um, items are, areas are there in the house. And they have to have at least um, $5,000 worth of uninsured flood damage so there has to be a tie back to Matthew so we'll calculate those all that data and we'll provide a, a point tally to the local staff and then we meet with them and, and determine the priority as far as uh, filling the spots for the rehab and reconstruction so it's a collaborative effort between me as a program administrator and the local staff and what I heard you say income is going to play a vital role in yeah. determination because this is coming under hood funding. Yes, it is. It's an LMI, low to moderate income, so they have to be below 80% of the Craven County median income. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Any other questions? We have a motion. Second. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Liner? Yes. Commissioner McKay? Yes. Commissioner Sampson? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Chairman Mark? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Human Resources, Amber Parker. Good evening, Chairman, Commissioners. I have for you tonight for your consideration and approval the proposed 2019 Craven County holiday schedule. This schedule grants 14 holidays which includes three days for Christmas and two floating holidays. And this holiday schedule is the same as the state of North Carolina's with the exception of the two floating holidays. Okay. We have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in, uh, any discussion? Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Nays, ayes have it. 
Next is appointments. Pending appointments, Adult Care Home Advisory Committee. We have five vacants, vacancies. And I believe a letter went out from me asking them when they were going to start filling them. <laughs> okay. Uh, Craven County Board of Adjustments, we have three vacancies. And I think we have them here. Uh, uh, Diane Donald is seeking reappointment to the Craven Community. Child protection team. Do I? Uh, oh, I forgot. To, uh, excuse me. Adult care home advisory committee. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would nominate Ms. Cheryl Wyatt okay. for reappointment. Craven Community Child Protection. Diane Donald seeking reappointment. I'll nominate. Okay. Fire tax commission. Otto Simmons is seeking reappointment for fire tax commissioner. Uh, District 2. Mr. Chairman, I would nominate Mr. Simmons. Okay. Emergency Medical Service Council. Nick Salter has submitted an application contained in attachment 9B for appointment to the Emergency Medical Advisory Council to replace Todd Wade, plus Gene Matthew, Mark Dow, and James Davis and Doug Ferguson are seeking reappointment. I would nominate him, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Juvenile Prevention Council, Donner Strayhorn has submitted an application contained in attachment 9B for appointment to the Juvenile Crime Council. I'll, I'll appoint that one. Upcoming appointments, Riverbend Planning Board and Fire Tax Commissioner Rolf Morrison District, says District 2, uh, I guess that's the fire department, it's in my district, but okay. County Attorney's Report. Mr. Chairman, a few matters tonight. The first is a final acceptance of an offer to purchase uh, parcel numbers 1044-4000 uh, based upon its location. It's not assigned a postal address. The county previously received an offer for $1,600. It was advertised for upset bids. There were no upset bids, and so it is now before you for final approval. A motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. What are this, what is the newspaper charging us for? It's it, it's not cheap. It's three four hundred dollars usually uh, per. Okay. Go ahead. And we had vote. I don't, it's just a yeah, up and down. Up and down. Those in favor say aye. 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 Nays. The ayes have it. Uh, the next matter is an offer, final acceptance of an offer for 509 Brawl Street, the former uh, probation office. This is one that we've advertised, and I think there were 10 upsets when all was said and done, but these will be 10 times we don't mind paying the, the advertisement because the final offer for this property after the final upset period is $240,000, the initial offer being $120,000. I think you're going to have a bunch of eyes on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Nays. The ayes have it. Uh, the next Long time that building went. <laughs> the uh, next matter is a resolution for you to consider to opt in to a federal class action lawsuit in the uh, case of Kane County, Utah versus United States. Uh, the federal government pays many local governments around the country um, what are called payment in lieu of uh, taxes or PILT fees. Um, it's the federal government's uh, attempt to make up for its impact to the tax base due to you know, the federal government's um, conduct and, and removing properties from the tax base. Uh, a federal class action lawsuit was uh, filed, and the court has already determined that, in fact, Congress did underfund all the local governments from 2015 to 2017. There are still a few matters left to be resolved. Uh, but the county, as a member of the eligible class, is entitled to opt in to this litigation, in which case, um, once the final numbers are determined, the county would, would receive what it was due. Uh, there's no cost to the counties, although obviously um, the law firm would get their fees uh, awarded by the court first in the balance. Um, were the county not to opt in to recover its fees, it would have to file its own uh, federal lawsuit. And so it's our recommendation that we do, in fact, opt in to the class action lawsuit with the resolution attached. Okay, do I have a 
Second. Second. Mr. Chairman, if I could ask a question. Uh, Jack, is this, this is underpayment, not this was, uh, who calculates that? How did we determine we were shorted? Was it? Looking at Craig, I, there's a formula based on the number of acres in the county. Yeah. Department of Interior is correct, makes that determination, does the calculation. We've done a little rough math. I mean, you're talking $20,000 or less to the county, but it's still $20,000 or less that we were owed by the federal government. This doesn't cost us anything, you know, so it's, it's going after money that the county was due. Okay. We have a motion. My and let me be clear, my calculation could be wrong, uh, but we'll certainly depend on the law firm to help us figure out our damages and things like that, what we run to fund. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nays, the ayes have it. And Mr. Chairman, let me see, is there anything else going on I might want to talk to you about? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, if I may, just real quick, as the board knows, um, I have um, announced my um, notice, uh, provided my notice to my law firm and to the county that I'll be resigning as the county attorney at the first meeting of September. Um, and. It's not because of your request on the ERA, as you suggested earlier, <laughs> but to be clear, I am in fact uh, moving to Europe um, to pursue some opportunities. So uh, you still got me for another month. I'll be here for two more meetings, and I, obviously my last meeting might want to say a few thanks, but just I do want to say thank you now as well. So thank you for your support and your understanding. Don't forget about if, us. Y'all uh, come see me. Yeah, sure. If, if, we ask, right. if we can ask the county manager, let's make sure his plate is full. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. Believe Thank me. You <laughs> Got him on speed <laughs> dial right now. Yeah. I just call him just, just to talk. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd like to take care of you, sir. If I ever get to Europe, I'll look you up. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. County manager's report. <laughs> Chair, Commissioners, I got to tell you, we've had uh, the luxury of working with a great county attorney, Mr. Hicks. I've certainly enjoyed my time with him. He's been a big help to me. So, Jimmy, thank you, buddy. And I, I'm sure I'll say a few more things to you as time goes on. I'm not sure we're going to let him leave yet. We might revoke his passport if we figure out how. So, um, just a couple things. I know we've had a lengthy meeting tonight. I wanted to update you on the opioid task force. Uh, a lot of work's been done over the last few months. You've got four very active committees, as Commissioner Jones mentioned, one of them earlier. Uh, they are meeting frequently. I'm trying to attend as much as I can. I know some of you are involved and in getting to participate in that process. I would still have the door open. If there's any committee you're interested in and, and attending, please do. I think you'll be pleased with the amount of work. A uh, couple major issues coming out is, of course, Commissioner Jones uh, highlighted earlier, trying to get the message out about awareness. That dovetails into the education component and what we can be doing with younger kids. Uh, Dr. Dole's heading that committee up, who I think is the right person there for what curriculum-based activities uh, we can start focusing on and as Mr. Sampson says sometimes we can't forget about the younger children and adults uh, that's obviously a problem as your whole life um, as we've seen this crisis affect all uh, we've got our law enforcement community actively working on different ways they can collaborate and finally we've got a treatment uh, committee who's doing all types of different things particularly uh, was heavily involved in the Onslow detox center which you invested in uh, back during the budget I'm really pleased with the way the work is. I'm sort of the floater in this, but if you have questions or have thoughts that come up, please let me know and I'll certainly get with that committee and, and get your thoughts there. Quick update on the Onslow Detox Center. Uh, they're having another uh, meeting on Wednesday down in Onslow County. They have uh, gotten their RFP out for someone to run the facility. They've gotten their responses back. I'll be attending that uh, to go through those with them. They were, the responses look good. I have reviewed them so far. Uh, we're still looking for a late fall, early December time frame for the doors to be open. A little bit behind schedule, but they had some trouble getting answers, you know, from the state and working with Trillium on the RFP and how all that dance happened. But everything's uh, still progressing nicely. The construction's underway. Um, I know we certainly still have the need. Uh, we're starting to see some statistics again pop up um, for overdoses and things like that. Lastly, I'd mention I wish Mr. Kite would have stayed. I wanted to talk about what Stanley's done with our ODMAP program. It's a program the federal government started through the DEA. It tracks overdose, not only deaths, but overdose where people were revived with a, a Narcan or naloxone type treatment. Uh, it even goes into how many naloxones they needed when they were treated. It is a very fascinating map. It geographically shows you where the overdose areas. And 
we've been able to put data in for the last three years so we can trend and see when a really bad batch of heroin or a really bad batch of fentanyl came in. You can see how those overdoses are clustered together. You can also see areas where we need to focus on outreach, and I'm looking at Commissioner Jones on that. There are certain areas in the county where you can see there's, there's sort of a bullseye right there. So that's the things we're doing. Stanley has single-handedly, and, and Patty in his office, put that map together. And right now what we're trying to do is get our partners in the municipal world to put their data in. Because So right now we've only been able to get the county's data in. Uh, and they're working on that, uh, but we don't have that full picture yet. But I would hope to, and, and I'd like for Stanley to come demo that for you, probably in September, maybe the night meeting, so there'll be more public here, to take a look at what they've done. It's a little, I mean, it's a little sobering, honestly, quite frankly, to see that, but certainly something that, that, that a lot of hard work's been put into. Lastly, uh, I mentioned to you a couple months ago, I was appointed to the uh, 911 State Study Group. It's uh, through the Department of Information Technology at the state level. I'll be there representing the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners as a county representative. What this does is it's the next five-year future of 911 funding and 911 technology in North Carolina. I'm really excited to have that opportunity. Uh, quite frankly, I've had some concerns over time I've shared with the board about how that funding comes down in the counties and are we getting our fair share and how it's distributed and what it will pay for. Uh, so I will be participating in that. The first meeting is August 23rd. And if you have comments or questions about that, please let me know, and I'll certainly take those forward to that committee. Uh, with that, that's all I have unless you have questions for me. Anybody have any questions? Thank, Thank you, sir. You, sir. Uh, before we get involved in the uh, commission's reports, and I've been asked if we could uh, take, uh, to not do the commission's reports by one of the commissioners due to the fact we have a closed session. But uh, I had received a call uh, in between our sessions, and we didn't have a session two weeks, two weeks ago from uh, somebody representing, well, it's Robert Lowe, and uh, his program is called On Demand. And uh, each featured participant on the demand seems required to contribute cutting edge educational content for our short form documentary series. Each educational documentary is self-contained and runs on public television stations across the country. These documentations feature a wide variety of topics and are used to enlighten the public television audience. The primary concentration is geared towards providing groundbreaking content with each documentary segment. Now, we were chosen by them. However, uh, and I just want to inform you, uh, they're going to call me tomorrow and, and I'm going to say to them that we'd have to discuss this further, but it would cost us Twenty-seven thousand dollars to do this. Okay. Yeah. 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 We do it uh, sideways. <laughs> and basically, it's it's a ten-minute piece. Uh, I don't know if anybody has seen on demand, uh, but it's on television quite quite often. I've seen it a couple of times, uh, and they do a whole thing on the county. Uh, it's from an educational standpoint, from workforce development standpoint, and that area. So it's just something that we can discuss at a, another meeting, and I will tell them that we're, we're not interested at this point, uh, because I, uh, that $27,000 was thrown at me at the last minute. <laughs> so just uh, something to remind you. Now, I had a, a motion from one of the commissioners to forego the commissioners. Uh, Before you do that, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, and I'd like to get this out if I could. Okay. Just so we, if we go into it, at least I get this out. I want to make everyone aware. I want to thank this board, first of all. Uh, I asked you to apply for, apply for a seat on the national level of Veterans Affairs Committee uh, at the annual NACO meeting. I was a presidential appointment for the Veterans Affairs Committee that I will <coughs> sit on, on that. And also to let you know I got word Friday that I have been selected from the North Carolina League of, League of County Governments to attend the advanced leadership training course in Chapel Hill from 30 September to 5 October. Mm. I'll be Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I have something that I need to well, get out here. Uh, can we do it after the public hearing? No, I, I, want, I want to do it now before I forget it. Uh, we had uh, 
about a couple of weeks ago, we had a male summit at the convention center, and it was a smashing success. We had a lot of young, young boys and girls out there, and it went over real big. It was crowded. It was a nice venture, and it had a lot of attendance on Saturday, Saturday morning. It started at 9 o'clock. Also, uh, I was reading an article in the Sun Journal about how many hungry people we have in Craven County. Now, a lot of us don't face this issue, but it's a very important issue when people are walking the street hungry. Because a lot of them don't have nowhere to live at, but they're still hungry. So I'd just like to, for the city and county to come together and see could we do something about, we have a lot of people bringing in groceries, trying to help people, but we just don't have enough. So we need to look at this. Another thing I'd let, like to let you know is uh, my son had a heart attack in Florida, and he's still in the hospital. And I keep right on thinking about it. He, he's he about, about 65 years old, and I just want to offer a short prayer for him with the Lord to come in and see about it. Our Father, our God, as I only come before thee, much of what I ask, I thank you, Father, for all you've done for me already, Father. Oh, Father, I thank you that I'm not selfish in asking you to really take care of him. But, Father, I know it's your decision, and I can't do anything about it. But you've been so good to me in the past. Father, oh, Mr. Father, if you do it or whether you do it or don't do it, you're still my Savior, and I still appreciate what you already done. So, Father, go with him, stand by, go with his family, Father. Let him get well if be your will, Father, but if not, Father, you're still in charge. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, sorry to hear about your son. Sorry to hear about a man but your son. Uh, going to closed session, a motion for uh, NCGS 143-318-11. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 aye.